the hindus believe that if you take a dip in the ganga all your sins are washed away election in india winning an election in india means for a politician that all the past sins of that particular individual are washed away people have forgotten that but somehow the economy does not forget people might forget but economy does not forget You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. Although India faces numerous challenges, a huge population, rising unemployment, growing environmental vulnerabilities, there's general agreement that despite many odds, democracy has not only survived but is now firmly entrenched in the social and political fabric of the country. In recent months, however, the country has been rocked by nationwide protests following the enactment of the Citizen Amendment Act in December 2019. And then COVID struck. On the 24th of March, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced that the country was going into a three-week nationwide lockdown. The sheer scale of this nationwide lockdown affecting 1.3 billion people was unprecedented. In subsequently extending the lockdown beyond the initial three weeks, the Prime Minister noted, and I quote, India didn't wait for the problem to escalate. Instead, as soon as the problem appeared, we tried to stop it by making swift decisions. I can't imagine what the situation would have been had such quick decisions not been taken. End quote. In the initial weeks and months, the lockdown appeared to be working well. But once it was gradually lifted, there was a surge in COVID cases. And many within the country, including my parents, who live in Kolkata, remain worried that the country's healthcare system may not be able to tackle a crisis of such magnitude. But there's also growing evidence of how India has radically stepped up its COVID testing capacity. And last year, an ambitious new health insurance plan was launched, the Ayushman Bharat Yojana, which aims to provide free health coverage to large groups in the country. Joining me to discuss India's COVID response, health insurance policies, centre-state relations in the country's federal setup, the role of political parties in promoting development and reducing poverty, and much, much more is Mr. Tatagata Satpati. Tatagata Satpati served four terms as Member of Parliament representing the Dhenkanal constituency of the state of Orissa, also now known as Odisha. Until recently, he was a member of the Biju Janata Dal, or the BJD political party, and was the party's chief whip in the Lok Sabha, the lower house of the Indian parliament. In addition to being a politician, Mr. Satpati is the owner and editor of the daily Odia newspaper Dharitri, and the English daily Orissa Post. I first met Tatagata in the late 1990s while conducting fieldwork in Orissa, and we've stayed in touch ever since. I began by asking him to reflect on the COVID situation in India, the enormously complex and difficult to implement and yet reasonably successful lockdown, and the subsequent reopening of the economy, which has resulted in a huge spike in new COVID cases. How is it like to live in India with this COVID threat looming everywhere? Thank you, Dan. Thank you for getting me involved in this thing. Today is 25th of July. Our nationwide lockdown started on 25th of March 2020. 
So today is probably the 122nd or 123rd day of uh, the commencement of the lockdown. Interestingly, many parts of the country are still under lockdown, like Orissa is under lockdown, Goa is under uh, shutdown, parts of Bangalore, uh, parts of Karnataka, including Bangalore city, are under lockdown. Delhi and Bombay, they claim, are opening up. But they are kind of locked down, like many shops, restaurants, bars, nightclubs, all these cannot open even now. While we had a few hundred cases when the commencement of the lockdown, nationwide lockdown started on 25th morning, the cases were in hundreds, but today the cases are in hundreds of thousands and deaths have increased. My guess is, and I'm not a medical expert, so I cannot give you medical feedback, but my guess is there was a huge amount of mismanagement because initially the impression that the political leaders in India got is that somehow Indians are immune to COVID-19 infections. And that kind of bolstered their self-confidence so much that starting from the Prime Minister Narendra Modi to various chief ministers, they all started boasting that we have brought it under control. It is a mass movement. And supposedly the people's movement was led by the prime minister. And that gave a sense of slight carelessness to the people that probably we have overcome this, which I thought was a wrong message to give out at that stage. Over a period of time, people lowered their guards. They did not really stick to basic security measures like using a mask and keeping social distancing which is even more important and as you might be knowing india is a very populated country we have this tendency to all flock together we all like to be touching each other which you in europe do not come across so much but here in india it's a very common thing if you go to a vegetable market then uh, you see that people are jostling and pushing and uh, while you are paying the cashier maybe somebody else has put her or his hand over your hand and is trying to pay earlier so that kind of a physical distance also went down and in the process we have a very bad state of affairs right now the disease like i used to call it initially now others are also putting it like that the bce era before corona era and the ad era after disease era the ad era is to come but the uh, bce era we had we could have handled it a lot better personally i feel this is an imported disease it is not something indigenous to indians or india we have had the advantage of time because when uh, Europe, especially Italy and Spain and other countries started soaring in December, January, February, that period, we didn't really react. Instead, what had happened is early February, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he even offered to send doctors and nurses to uh, Wuhan, China claiming that India will stand by China. And the very first fleet of about eight aircraft, seven, triple seven aircrafts of Air India were sent to Wuhan to evacuate students and businessmen who were there in large numbers. Now, this might sound very mean on my part. It might sound very selfish. But I wrote in my newspaper on the front page edit, that this is a time when uh, anybody who is considerate uh, towards the interests of India should immediately stop allowing people to come in, into the country. This, I realize, it sounds very selfish. But I believe personally that uh, after our first batch of load came, uh, passengers came in from Wuhan, 
The second one was from Italy. They brought in people from Roma and from Milano. And the third was one from Malaysia. When our aircrafts brought back the people, those countries were charged with COVID-19 uh, infections. What I had suggested in my editorial was that it would be wiser for the government of India to ask the Indian embassies in the respective countries that they spend money for the well-being, for the rent, for the food, for the medical care and basic expenses of the Indians who are there. And there were very few tourists except, as far as I know, except some 146 or 150 tourists in Turkey. We didn't have too many tourists stuck outside. It was mostly businessmen who were there for a long time. They are, many of them were uh, Indian passport holders, but a lot of them were domiciled in those countries. And there were a lot of students who had been there for years together. So they were not people who would have been lost in their homes. So they could have stayed on there and the government of India could have spent for them Ask them to hold on in those places, giving them money in their bank accounts, and could have said that we are safeguarding the homeland from infection. We did not do that. We brought back people from all of, from all those countries which were uh, soaring with COVID-19 uh, infections. Another thing is that the rightist communal government ruling India now of Narendra Modi. The government very willingly gave visas to 100, about 140 Tablighi Jamaat Muslim Maulanas from Malaysia and Indonesia to come into India in March to participate in the Tablighi Jamaat function at New Delhi, at Nizamuddin. Then uh, that, is a, uh, that is a regular annual festival that the Muslims of this part of the world have. And this Tablighi Jamaat is not only in India, it is there in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and one or two other countries. It's one sect of the Maulanas, of the Imams, of the leaders, the priests of the mosques. So when these people came, uh, then couple of people were traced with COVID-19 infections who came out of the uh, meeting, so out of that gathering. Then the government and the NSA, the National Security Advisor Ajit Doval, he went to Nizamuddin in Delhi where the Tablighi Jamaat was being held. He talked to the main Maulanas and he took the decision that it is better for all of you to immediately disperse. So some 2,000 odd people, all Maulanas from different parts of the country, they immediately left that gathering and they dispersed. Once they dispersed, with the foreigners being present there, and I have heard recordings of those speeches when those Maulanas were speaking, you could hear hundreds of people coughing in the background, which is a weird thing because you normally... I have attended so many meetings in my life, thousands of meetings. We don't hear so many people cough all the time incessantly. So you could make out something was wrong. But the government of India instructed them to disperse. So they dispersed. And once they dispersed, the infection also spread, including to Orissa, to Katak, and to Bhadra, where, from where Molanas had gone to Delhi. They came back. And obviously, their families and their neighborhoods got infected. In Bhubaneswar, the capital of Orissa, there was infection. Then the whole thing was twisted that COVID-19 is, uh, is an Islamic jihadi tool to being used by the Muslims of India to settle scores with the rightist government. So that was a very childish thing. But that, apart from the political angle, the health angle which I felt, one was bringing back people from uh, affected countries and the second was dispersing the crowd at the Tablighi Jamaat. These were things, a few things, there are many others, but a few examples I'm giving you, which could have actually contained the uh, infection from spreading. So one of the uh, 
many debates that I've been looking into in terms of India's initially widely acclaimed lockdown is the fact that it was, of course, a big surprise to many that India was able to have that lockdown, things that we thought only China could impose. But India did it relatively successfully. There has been criticism that it was done very quickly without much warning and that it adversely impacted the lives of the people in the informal economy, rural migrants working in the major cities. What is your impression of this problem? For a long time, of course, India has had a hugely important informal economy, but it has not got the kind of attention that it deserves until the lockdown took place and COVID emerged. So the problem of rural migrants, the problem of the informal economy, how do you see that playing out in Orissa? It's a very funny thing. This is not just Orissa. All of eastern India, that is Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand, Orissa, and parts of Assam, these are the states that contribute a bulk of the migrant labor to the industrialized parts of India, that is the western and the northern, northern part, even, in, even parts of South India. A state like Orissa had, maybe there are a lot many more migrants, but the people who came back numbered about 1.2 million people. These people came mostly from Gujarat, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and a lot from Delhi also. As I was mentioning earlier, the crisis happened primarily because the announcement of the lockdown was without any forewarning, without any notice. The Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he announced on tele national television at 8 p.m. on 24 March 2020 that the lockdown will take effect from midnight of 24 March, uh, that means early morning of 25 March 2020. This short notice, what happened is it upset the lives of millions of people across the country. I personally believe, and I'm trying to take a very unbiased stand here, I personally believe the surprise element was not at all necessary at that time in India because our number of cases were extremely limited and also we did not, we also lacked the testing abilities at that time, those kits, you know, PCR, RT-PCR kits and the NAT test kits, we did not have them in enough numbers across the country. So these uh, people from abroad had already come back, all the Indians who were living abroad had come back and this disease had already been imported back into the subcontinent. Now about the informal economy, if we'll touch that and come back to the migrant labor. See, the informal economy is something everybody knows about its existence in, a, uh, in the background, but the size is immense. The size of the Indian informal economy is, in my opinion, is probably twice the size of the formal economy. It is probably only the government which feigns uh, ignorance about the existence of this economy. And this is not the first time that it has happened with the COVID-19 uh, mass migration of immigrant labor. It started in 2016 November when the Prime Minister in the first term of his, of his government announced a demonetization of 500 rupee notes and 1000 rupee notes. You see, the Indian rupee has been so many times devalued and its buying power has gone down so much that even common people, an auto rickshaw driver, a taxi driver, a farmer, a, a daily wage earner, they also saved all their money in uh, cash and in uh, currencies of values of 500 and 1000. Now you may ask, why do Indians save uh, money in cash? So what happens? Like I'll give you an example of my constituency. There are clusters of villages with populations which may range, each village may have say a 1000, 1200 people and these clusters might have 12,000, 15,000 people. The nearest 
common bank for them would be nothing less than 20 to 25 kilometers away. Now imagine even somebody who lives in the western part of the world, if you have to drive to reach your bank, because everybody does not have access to the internet, net banking is not a common thing here, is not a very popular thing here, people are not that well educated or uh, they are technically challenged that they cannot operate the banking thing from their mobile phones. So what happens if they have to go and deposit their daily earnings in a bank, they spend that much money going to and fro. So people also avoid going to banks because it's a cumbersome uh, experience for them. And when they need money, they need money urgently. There are also families where say the daughter is going to get wed or some other function is to take place. The father has died. There is some uh, service to be done for that. So they need cash all the time. The first blow to the informal economy, therefore, came with demonetization in November 2016. It was a severe blow. The country had not actually raised its head after that blow had hit the economy. In quick succession, about seven, eight months later, the implementation of the goods and services tax, GST, took place. And that again, what happened? There were so many books that needed to be kept. There were so many accounting processes that small businesses, tiny businesses, small industries, you know, home industries, domestic industries, and very small operators, they had to spend more than their profit in hiring a chartered accountant, in hiring a lawyer, in putting up their papers in shape. So that was a that was the second major reason for which the economy started slowing down in a very considerable manner. So 2016, 2017, then we had our elections in 2019 where Mr. Modi came back with a larger number of people, um, a larger number of members in the, of his party in parliament. So everybody thought that demonetization and the implementation of GST has actually endeared Mr. Modi to the people. And his, his drive against Muslims, his drive against the backward classes, his uh, other uh, negative impacts all got washed away. This is a general tendency in India that once you win an election, it kind of absolves you of all past sins. Like the Hindus believe that if you take a dip in the Ganga, all your sins are washed away. Election in India, winning an election in India means for a politician that all the past sins of that particular individual are washed away. People have forgotten that. But somehow the economy does not forget. People might forget, but economy does not forget. So we were not yet fully back up on our feet when the COVID-19 thing started in 2020. I think it is particularly interesting that you mentioned the demonetization uh, campaign and the jury has for long been out, I suppose. There have been all kinds of arguments for and against. But what I think is interesting, what you're pointing to is this gradual increase in vulnerability among certain sections of the Indian population. One of the things I also wanted to ask you in relation to what you just said were some of these at least some would claim, very popular schemes that were launched before the last elections. And one of them had to do with this national health insurance scheme. When this was launched, uh, you know, there was a lot of positive media coverage that we're talking about hundreds of millions of Indians would be covered. Healthcare is expensive. Healthcare is absent. And I'm sure you know this in terms of your own uh, district, your, your own constituency. But what was your initial take on that health insurance scheme and how do you see that impacting the current situation? Is this just a lot of talk, a lot of rhetoric without any substance or is it really having an impact, this Ayushman Bharat? The Ayushman Bharat scheme is an excellent scheme. There is no denying that fact. The only problem that arises in India is implementation. The ideas are brilliant, 
and whoever thinks of those ideas, their their sincerity cannot be challenged. But when implementation comes, suppose I am dying, say of malaria, or I have an acute heart problem and I am on my deathbed, and you as the government come along and give me fifty thousand rupees, whereas uh, for even a pacemaker, I would have to spend say seventy-five thousand rupees to a hundred thousand rupees. To put in a pacemaker, and the rupee is seventy uh, rupees to a US dollar today, twenty-one rupees nearly. So when you expect uh, that I have given you fifty thousand rupees, uh, and what is your problem? See, it does not solve the problem that way. First thing. Second thing is that how do I apply? Do I have uh, family members who are backing me? I need that. I need people within my close circuit who will go and fill up like umpteen forms in government offices, and then the government officer also concerned of my area has to be that efficient and responsive that they process it, and while I am on my deathbed, the money actually comes and I get the benefit. But let us assume all that works. Let us assume all that is good. The Government officers are efficient. The response time is short. All that is good, but think of something like COVID-19. What is Ayushman Bharat capable of doing now? Nothing, because here the problem is completely different. Our uh, initial response, and all politicians believe this, is that Indians are not going to get badly affected by COVID-19. Somehow this this, this race. Because of the filth they live in, because of their lifestyle, because of their food, because of our hot weather, probably this is not going to affect us. It is only going to affect countries with cooler climes. This was a strong belief that people told me, and I used to laugh at them at that time. And these were serious people. These were senior people. These were not jokers. And I was thinking, why would you think that a virus will it not adjust to the climate? Will it not adjust to everything? And that is exactly what has happened. I am not saying I am a future, I am a seer or something, but this was common sense. And some of my doctor friends had told me the same thing that no, 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 this is this is humbug. This is going to hit us very bad because we are not taking care. And uh, from borrowed knowledge, I realized that yes, something will happen. And that is exactly what we are going through. Right now, so while Ayushman Bharat is okay for a standard kind of a person with a normal disease, which will take a long time, say somebody has cancer, and it's a prolonged thing, then Ayushman Bharat might be useful for a one-time financial assistance. It's a one-time thing. It is not that it's an ongoing thing. But if it is something like a heart ailment or something like a, a virus infection, it will have no impact. Another aspect is we have an uh, insurance regulatory authority in India, which has been put up uh, during the Congress uh, government ten years ago, and uh, this regulatory authority, when it drafted the rules, like what were to be covered by a personal income, uh, uh, what was a person. Covered for under a personal insurance scheme, they kept out virus infections and quite a few other diseases. So now, if somebody is uh, insured in India, a full, complete, comprehensive insurance, and is affected by COVID and dies under the COVID umbrella, the family will get no insurance. So that's a very interesting thing. Now, what is happening is. Not only is the government hiding the true figures, they are smudging the true figures. The families are also saying that please don't write that my father or my sister or my brother died because of COVID because we will not get the insurance. Now we are poor people; we need the insurance. He was our daily bread earner, so it's a very convenient situation for the government. The government does not have to lie. The family itself is asking the doctors, please don't give the reasons of death as COVID-19. Please give it as something else. So now they are saying lung failure, heart failure, this infection, that infection, but not COVID. 
Is it a case of uh, stigma, social stigma, or is it just a case of fulfilling government criteria? But there is a social stigma for sure. COVID patients, I don't know, they are looked at as if they are, uh, you know, in the early days, like people used to look at AIDS uh, affected people, that if, if you touch them, you would get AIDS. And then they, later on, they realize that, no, that is not how it happens. COVID has that kind of a color in the in average Indian's mind. One of the many criticisms has also been that, uh, let's say, after this uh, so-called uh, impressive lockdown was initiated, the criticism has been that the government should have actually spent more time planning and bolstering and strengthening the health system. The criticism has been that that did not take place so that when the lockdown was lifted, the health system was just not simply able to cope with the rising cases. Do you agree with that criticism? Yes, to a great extent, yes. The government did try. See, uh, we cannot blame everything on the government also. The government is uh, pretty incapable in India in the sense that it cannot do many things which normally in a smaller European country you would take it for granted from your government. That is simply not possible in India because of the size of the land, because of the population, more because of the population. See, China, if you compare India with China, China has a lot of other advantages. They don't have a free media. Their media can simply be asked to shut up on certain things and you will never know what is happening in reality. But in India, everything does go out. Like this, this insurance thing I was telling you. So many cases have come to my notice where the family members are saying, don't give him a certificate of death for COVID, give him some other reason. So it suits the government and the overall figure that the government puts out about COVID-19 deaths are much less, if not 50%, at least my feeling is at least 30% less than the real figures. So if there's 100 people dead, you get a figure of 60, 70 being dead and the rest are dead due to some other reasons. It is not that people are not dying of other reasons. Of course, people are dying of natural, normal age and uh, diseases are also there. Another problem that has happened with the health services is, and where you, what you pointed out now, the government did not pay attention primarily because what I was telling you earlier, they had an impression that Indians will not get affected by this uh, infection, by this virus. But what has happened is your average normal government hospital was not fully equipped. They didn't have nurses, they didn't have compounders, they didn't have doctors, there were not enough doctors and this is across the country. Whether it is Uttar Pradesh, whether it's Orissa, whether it is Karnataka, it's across the country. There's a dearth of doctors. So first of all, they were not fully staffed. Secondly, the number, the, uh, the equipment that they require, simply an oxygen connection to the beds, that did not exist in government hospitals. Your medicines, see right now they are mostly giving medicines, antibiotics and they are giving medicines for fever. But beyond that, they are not able to really deal with COVID patients in any way because there is nothing that they have. And uh, the immense rush of people that happened has upset the hospitals in such a manner that regular ailments, people with uh, long-standing ailments, are the ones who are now affected most, not by COVID-19. Maybe they are staying at home, they are safe, they have not been infected, but there is no hospital, no doctor willing to address their problems. Hospitals tell them that you go and get a check for your COVID-19 uh, negative uh, thing. You get a report, then only we uh, admit you into the hospital. So regular, normal patients are, have been completely neglected since late March till today. That is the major failure. Uh, I would put that on the government because this time that we had, the inter time between March 25 and till today, we could have set right our normal hospital processes so that the COVID patients are dealt separately and normal people without infection with normal ailments can be treated separately. That has not happened. And that is a major setback 
for our uh, healthcare system and for our government. In some of the uh, studies that I've done previously on India, many of these issues that you raise have come up. So, for example, you mentioned the capacity of the Indian state to implement is still weak. Planning may be possible. There are numerous good plans, but implementation suffers. And another issue that has often come up in my own work is center-state relations. And I wondered if you could reflect on this, the ability of the Indian state to implement, because you have some of the most competent civil servants. I've been highly impressed in your own state of Orissa, meeting IAS officers and, and just really brilliant people, administrators. But yet there are certain institutional constraints that prevent effective implementation. It could be political interference. It could be lack of funds. It could be um, New Delhi saying, we sent you the money, but uh, Risa saying, we haven't received it. You have all of these aspects. So if you could reflect a bit on this, the implementation aspect, but also on this uh, center-state relations aspect, which has plagued Indian politics for a long time. Our uh, problem of center-state relationships is not something now. The relations have been sweet and sour depending on uh, which political party is in power at Delhi and which political party is in power at the state level. That is a very fundamental question about the Indian federal setup. And our federal setup, although it has uh, very clear-cut demarcations in our constitution, which is in the con concurrent list, which is the state list, which is the central list, like education comes in the state list, but uh, let's say uh, river water comes in the concurrent list. Suppose a, a river is flowing from Chhattisgarh and Orissa happens to be the riparian state, then uh, it is uh, it's in the concurrent list. But then there is the center, there is Chhattisgarh, there is Orissa. So it's uh, there are many things which are still even after seventy plus years of independence. It has been left very vague because whenever any political party comes to power in the center, they want that every state should count out to their desires. It is like how you see Mr. Trump. That is what I have been observing on his, from his tweets. Uh, Mr. Trump, the way he gets irritated with democratic gov governors or mayors and he abuses them, as if his party people, wherever they are in power in whichever state in the U.S., they are performing much better, which is not the case. If you go into the infection cases and the number of deaths in those states, whether it is Democrat ruled or conservative or Republican ruled, it is it is more or less the same. But a similar situation arises in India also. With our federal setup. We have, uh, politicians have not allowed clarity on uh, many issues to be formed over a period of time which would help in administering. I agree that yes, there are very many brilliant bureaucrats, but bureaucrats being brilliant alone does not help because uh, like we were discussing earlier, it is the implementation machinery which has to deliver the last mile like the postman comes and gives you the letter on your doorstep in your letter box that last mile delivery in india is a herculean task and we have not been able to work it out for example the current government mr modi's government has in about two years ago it has no more than two years ago has announced that one nation shall have one ration card so with one ration card you will have you will have the ability to buy your food stuff at government rates which may not always be subsidized but regular government rates and you will not be overcharged anywhere in the country whether you go to jammu kashmir whether you go to tamil Nadu or orissa or maharashtra that one ration card should be effective for you to buy food for your family and for yourself at one rate across the country. That's a brilliant idea. And some bureaucrat has thought of this. 
previously what we had we have as it is existing now we have state ration cards if you have a ration card in orissa that will not be effective in delhi or in bombay you cannot go and buy government ration from uh, using that card so this is what was the existing system once you announce the one nation one card thing and you start issuing a few cards automatically the state cards become defunct so now the state cards are more or less defunct except a few states which are saying that unless the complete replacement takes place we are not going to make our card defunct like orissa has done that a few other states have done that but once you announce a scheme for it to be implemented it takes a very long time and that is where we are always getting beaten in the sense that we are not analyzing that for such a huge uh, billion and a half uh, one and a half billion people how long it will take for us to implement this distribution of the card getting all the details their photographs their fingerprints their uh, other data and in the process we have created a plethora of cards we have an income tax card we have a aadhar card we have uh, our of course our passports and driving license are common all over the world but we have so many there is a bpl below poverty line card there is an apl above poverty line card so there is too many uh, identification documents that you need to just live as a common citizen in india the, the last count i had made we needed about 14 documents including the driving license and the passport which many people do not have because they don't have cars so they don't have a driving license they are not traveling abroad so they don't have passports but if, except those two we need about 14 different identifications to function as a normal citizen whether to get food or to get a water connection or to get a gas cooking gas connection or to get electricity connections you need so many cards that people are always confused and uh, you know like assam i was talking to a friend of mine a journalist who lives in uh, guwahati and he was telling me that you will be surprised the floods we've had we haven't seen such floods for decades and uh, i'm sure you would have heard about it what has happened is many people live live in thatched houses uh, homes they live in temporary shelters so when you have this overnight flooding are they supposed to be collecting their aadhar cards and their belongings first and then rushing to safety with their children and their wives and their aged parents or the moment they hear the water is rushing towards them are they supposed to take their whole families and rush to a higher spot what would a human being do under natural circumstances so imagine if a few million people are affected by this flood in one state alone in assam imagine the number of people who would have lost their identification cards their various household goods so they are like non indians now they cannot prove their identity these are multiple problems which come in we don't we have been able to sort these things out you know i think those are really really fascinating uh, examples that you mentioned because and to the listeners we have to of course clarify that india has some of the most comprehensive wonderful social protection programs in the whole world we're talking about the icds for for children and nursing mothers we're talking about food subsidies through the public distribution system these are just mammoth programs and any country in the world would struggle to to implement uh, these programs they are expensive they are often targeted and as you rightly mentioned there are all kinds of categories and classifications so so we just have to you know be aware that this is a huge challenge and india has had a wonderful long history of doing so but one of the things that you just mentioned i think i just got got me thinking every time i'm in india i'm my parents still live in kolkata i try to often help them in terms of it could be a tv subscription it could be a telephone subscription it could be internet whatever 
there's a plethora of choices. It's almost like India and the U.S. actually have something in common. That is, if you go to a store, there's just so much to choose from. And any service provider provides just tens or just numerous services. So it's often very confusing. And I wanted to put that out on the table at the moment. It's just why? And the question really is, why have just so many choices? Because, and some of these choices are very difficult. It's difficult to know for the consumer how they differ from each other. And, and this relates to what you were saying about these identity cards. Why have so many? Why not just stick to one? Is it a political issue that some governments introduce something and the new government will want something else? Why have 14 cards when you just need one? Exactly. This is what I had raised in Parliament. I had raised it about three or four times. I even moved a private member's bill uh, in which I wanted the government to adopt it, actually, because in India, private member's bills never get passed. So I wanted I wanted to put this idea into their uh, uh, system that uh, maybe you adopt it and let it be your child. I am not uh, demanding ownership. But bring it every bring everything under one umbrella, one Aadhaar card, however evil it may be, because it completely destroys the privacy of the individual. It wants everything from you. It, they even try to introduce a DNA uh, report into the Aadhaar card. I said, okay, you take everything we have, but give us only one card, one plastic indestructible card with my photograph and a chip. And the chip can hold all my details. It can have my ration card. It can have my uh, my details. It can have everything, whether I am APL, BPL, whatever. My economic uh, details, everything. My health conditions. They are like Ayushman. Ayushman also has a card. And uh, so I said, why not put everything on one card so a person can actually physically carry it on his person, on his body. Nobody pays heed because. Again, it is the brilliant bureaucrats we have. Every bureaucrat wants that his or her mark should be left in history. So she or he created this system. And if I accept the system that Dan has created, then where am I going to be in history? So Tathagat also has to have something else apart from Dan. That way I will be remembered. It is, I guess, this could be, I'm not saying this is the sole reason, but this is a major reason. See, in India, it's the bureaucrats who are the real government. Let's be honest. Politicians, they talk brave things that we will uh, remove the clutches of the bureaucracy. We will make it a people-oriented government. All that happens before elections. Once you are in power, then you completely forget it. Do you have time? Can I uh, can I recount a small Oriya story? There is a story. There was a washerman. He had a donkey and uh, his uh, young son. He used to take all the dirty clothes of the village, go to the riverside and wash it. And the son, the donkey used to wait. And the son used to fool around the young kid. The son used to run around, play while the father was working. And the son, on one fine day, noticed there is a hole and there is a tail sticking out. So it was some kind of a snake. He pulls the snake by the tail because the kid was not aware that it could be dangerous. Pulled the snake out, twirled it around, you know, over and over his head and then threw it. So this big snake went flying over the water and landed far off with a huge thud. That was a rat snake. So when this happened many times, and this kid used to do this regularly, there was a deadly cobra at that place where this snake used to fall with a thud. So that cobra finally came up to this rat snake and said, you are a shame to the whole snake family. But you are always coming and falling with a thud. What's happening with you? So the rat snake you know, recounted the whole story of this young kid who pulls him out and throws him like that and he can't do anything. So the cobra said, you don't know. I will eat you. But after I sort out the problem with this kid, 
So the next day, the cobra went and got into the hole and was waiting for the kid. The kid came, saw this yellow tail sticking and wagging, pulled out the cobra. The head was inside. The cobra couldn't do anything. The kid twirled it around again like that same thing and threw the cobra. So the cobra went and fell with the third. That time the rat snake was waiting there, said, sir, what happened this time? He said, no, it is the fault of that hole. So in India, all these politicians talk big. They're all big cobras when they are out of power. The moment they are in power, their head goes in and they don't see reality. They forget everything. And then they say that ah, it is the fault of the seat, of fault of the chair. This is what is happening with us now. Uh, I don't know if it sounds uh, negative. I'm not trying to be negative. But out of power, this particular gentleman, Mr. Modi, the one previous to him, Manmohan Singh, all of them had said that once we are in power, we are going to change the setup, which will be more responsive to the citizen, and we will bring down the powers of the bureaucracy. So uh, Modi's slogan was less government, more governance. But in reality, what happens in India? Suppose you want your child to be admitted in a school or you want to claim one of the, not school, let us say you want to claim one of the benefits from all the social schemes that are there. You want a home. There is this Indira Avas Yojana which has been renamed now the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, E-M-A-Y. That means Prime Minister's Home Scheme. So you want to claim that. You need so many papers and so many forms to be filled up you fill that up and you give it earlier what used to happen the government office concerned with this the block level office had enough staff so that i consider that to be more government and the staff however lazy however lethargic because there were so many in number and the applications were of a certain number it would get processed now, with this scheme that less government, more governance, and I don't know how that is feasible, you have less number of bureaucrats in this office, the lower level bureaucrats, the clerical level. So what happens, what used to get done in say a month or 45 days, now takes six months, eight months, one year. So when you have less government, you have less governance also. But these are slogans that most of these politicians in India give when they are out of power but when they are in power they see the other angle and then they succumb to the pressure of the bureaucracy in the process it is the people who are constantly getting deprived of of basic necessities it is not necessary to cut down government it is not necessary to increase governance what we need in india is to bring about more efficiency so one of the many reasons why I've enjoyed being in touch with you for, I don't know, several decades now, I first met you uh, 1999, 2000, I was doing my PhD field work in your state in Kalahandi, trying to look at starvation debts and trying to understand why starvation debts take place in, in uh, the world's largest democracy. I met you, you were then the uh, owner editor of, of your newspaper, Dharitri. Uh, and you were also a politician, and I asked you how it is to be a politician and a journalist editor. And you said you have different hats. You have a, and I remember this, I, I took notes during our, our interview. You said that as a politician, I put on my politician hat, and when I edit my newspaper, I put on a different hat, and, and politics is then, you know, far away. And subsequently, of course, since we, met then, you became a national level politician, you were elected to parliament, you represented the BJD party. And I wanted to ask you, and you still edit, of course, your newspaper, you also have an English version newspaper called the Orissa Post, you do your own editorials, you're a versatile man. And I wanted to ask you, what is it like to be a politician in India? Thank you, for, thank you for all the praise. It, it sounds good uh, this Saturday midday. 
but i don't think i am uh, there's so much more to do in life and i don't i don't feel satisfied with what i have been able to do for my society or for my country but apart from sounding cliche uh, that is true because i have been blessed with uh, a happy family and um, economically i will not uh, label myself as being poor but the people i work with and the society i live in is so very deprived and uh, we have we have created and we are all actively creating a society that that should be changed intolerance has become a huge part of our uh, character which is a sad part things like that are so overbearing that you sometimes feel that maybe uh, a very fundamental change is required in the outlook for indians for example our education system we put our children through a regimented education system where from the very early stages they are shouted upon they are physically assaulted by teachers they are uh, you know forced to study uh, a certain set syllabus without taking into account the individual child's abilities to learn the individual child's uh, interests of uh, any particular field if somebody wants to be a carpenter why would i want to teach him physics or chemistry and if somebody wants to be a physicist why would i teach him uh, history of akbar and baba where he only has to uh, rote learn rectify as we call it uh, the dates and the names and the names of the fathers and mothers and brothers and who killed whom and who ran away where and who was the queen so these details cramp our uh, children at the very early stages of life and in the process i believe we have managed very successfully to take away the ingenious uh, character aspect of indian children and through our regimentation process we have successfully managed to create a society where we are only producing job seekers so although we were considered an it par a decade or a decade and a half ago unfortunately we do not have any software worth its name which has been invented in india we were more or less like job contractors our big companies made a lot of money no doubt and they hired thousands tens of thousands of young indian boys and girls who were brilliant in the it industry but their total output was either in call centers or in producing software as say texas instrument would ask them to do it or google would ask them to do it or microsoft would ask them to do it so they were just fulfilling job contracts but the designs the idea the concept everything came from elsewhere it is not that our children are not capable our children are brilliant they have the best of abilities but our system system of education has been such that we have stunted their growth and in the process the present generation of indians and the foreseeable future generation of indians have been stunted which is a very sad thing for a society that has the ability to i believe has the ability to lead the world in very many ways we are losing out on uh, those aspects so as a politician that was the main question you asked how do you uh, how do i see myself as a politician i try to bring about i try to plant seeds i try to plant ideas that's all i can claim i have never tried to leave a mark on history because billions of human beings have come and gone nobody remembers them also that is not the idea but i have tried to plant the seed in the union government that we should not standardize our children we should not put them into a format which has been devised many decades ago 
and we will expect that country will become a global power with a set of human beings who are not of global standard. So, a more freer, a more all-encompassing, a more uh, open education system should be the priority of India. This has been one very important subject dear to my heart, which I have spoken on many times in Parliament, and I have tried to tried to bring in the idea that much more than economic liberalization, it is the mental liberalization that is required for India. And that can only happen if we address our children, the next generation. We might not have achieved it completely. So apart from education, another major problem that I have seen in, uh, in India, and I have, I cannot say across the whole subcontinent, I have seen every village, but in many states, about five, seven states that I have traveled in, in Tamil Nadu, for example, when I was studying in Pondicherry, I have traveled in uh, Tamil Nadu, traveled in Odisha, traveled in uh, Jharkhand, which was part of Bihar earlier. Uh, I have traveled in Uttar Pradesh. I have, except for uh, extreme Western states like Gujarat and Maharashtra, I have more or less seen rural parts, of other parts of India. There is a huge problem of clean drinking water in this country. And our water tables are falling because our agriculture has been so well tuned to use only groundwater and let the surface water go waste, let it get polluted and let it get destroyed, that we have spoiled our rivers, we have spoiled most of our surface water resources. We have completely come to realize, I think Indian agriculture, uh, I was reading a report, probably some 93, 94% of Indian agriculture depends on groundwater. So I tried to plant this idea that we have to cut the reliance on groundwater and make the farmer aware that surface water can be used and should be used and how to store and how to preserve the surface water. This was a, another pet subject for which even the MP lad local area development fund that we get as MPs, which is five crores, five crores, I don't know how much it would work out to in US dollars. That money in my four terms, at least two of the terms, I tried to create water harvesting structures whereby for drinking water at least, the surface water would be kept, preserved and would remain clean. So you have to do backward uh, linking and those are expensive projects but uh, I focused on that. I said that wherever I address, let us get at least one village, one panchayat, one block independent in terms of drinking water that they don't have to rely on anybody else supplying them with water or they don't have to uh, suffer due to shortage of water. Give us a sense of how it is to be a politician in India in terms of, say, being a member of the state legislative assembly or a member of parliament, as you have also been. What is it like to sit in these assemblies and, and when you do raise issues like education, like clean drinking water, like poverty reduction, like hunger? To what extent is there a focus on such issues, firstly? And secondly, how are those debates? Do you see your fellow politicians in your experience in the past? Is there a genuine interest in discussing these? Or is it the opposition asking critical questions and the government just fending off criticism? Because my impression sometimes is that, as you were also alluding to earlier, when you're in opposition, everything is a problem. When you're in government, then you try to deny that there is a problem. So give us a sense of how it is to sit through these debates, these questions, and whether there is a genuine interest in the world's largest democracy to really critically, genuinely, honestly, 
address these developmental issues? Let me start with the parliament first. I'll come to the legislative assembly, state assembly later on. Indian uh, parliament was one of the earliest one which had live telecast being done. I think it started in 2004 or 2005. And many people who didn't have an idea of how parliament functions got to know exactly what happens. What you were saying, that is the very essence. Most of the speeches of the ruling party would be singing fans to the leader. Whoever gets an opportunity to speak, that party whip is the authority who allots time and gives the names of which speaker will speak on which bill or which discussion. Whoever gets that sings praises of the leader. And that is also understandable because to further their political career, they cannot be critical or they cannot try to disseminate the real situation of the subject under discussion because that might upset the leader, that might upset the party that's in power. So if you do that, your future is every time you open your mouth, it becomes your future becomes bleaker and bleaker and bleaker and you can never become a minister. You can never attain great heights in your political career. So eventually, if you are not really very popular with the people, you may not even get a ticket to contest the next time. This is about the ruling party. I have not seen when the Congress was uh, ruling in India, UPA 1 and 2, or prior to that when Atal Bihari Vajpayee, my first term in parliament was when Atal Bihari Vajpayee was prime minister, that time the BJP, or now the BJP under Mr. Modi. The ruling party members never really come up with any solid suggestions. I am not talking about advice, but suggestions on how to bring about qualitative change in whatever bills or whatever laws are being brought forth in parliament for passing. That leaves the opposition. The opposition also, many times I have seen, they oppose because they are in the opposition. But when it comes to giving alternatives, I am not saying I have all the alternatives. None of us have all the answers. But possible remedies to long-standing problems do exist and those are not really discussed much in the house. Therefore, the discussions, if you take out minutes and you read them, these are mostly centered around political subjects. These are not centered around solid suggestions of how to improve governance. And as far as laws and bills and acts are concerned, whether it is the insurance acts, whether it is the banking sector act. Now the government is trying to dilute the banking act so that we don't have more than four or five nationalized government banks, but most banks will get privatized now. There is a fear that when that happens, the average depositor has no certain knowledge that her or his money deposited in fixed deposits or in current accounts will remain safe when the bank is transferred to a private sector. Because the government may say that there's 100 rupees in this bank, you buy it at 40 rupees, I give you 40 rupees, I am taking away 60 rupees. So the man gets the benefits of the bank, its real estate and everything, the private uh, player gets all those benefits and gets the name, the goodwill, or whatever, the staff and everything else for 40 rupees of something worth 100 rupees. But he also gets 40 rupees of the deposits. What happens to the 60 rupees that the government kept back? Will that be compensated to the depositor by the private player? Will the government compensate it? Will that happen? This is a fear that is lurking in the minds of many Indians now. So when these when these uh, bills come up for, for passing, there's a lot of discussions, for sure. But nobody asks for clarity. Nobody, uh, nobody suggests, uh, I won't say nobody, that is unfair. No, I'm sorry, I take it back. Not nobody. Many people do suggest, but those are not taken note of. So our politicians finally end up giving a lot of speeches, which are proving ineffective or 
they do not have any value in actually transforming the governance system. So politics in India today is your primary interest is how do you get re-elected? That's the first interest. Once you are re-elected, then only you can uh, claim office or you can claim benefits. That also is in a way good because that forces you to keep in touch with your voters, that forces you to keep in touch with people. If that was not there, if this five-year term for Lok Sabha or the Assembly was not there, I am quite sure the politicians after getting elected would not even go back to their constituency. So this re-election is a very positive thing when politicians have that feeling in their mind because it strengthens the base of democracy. The politician is compelled to, to go back to the populace, to go back to the voters, to talk to them and to possibly address their problems. But here what happens, in a situation like this, you are no more a mere legislator. You are not actually legislating laws to the best of your ability and to the best of your intelligence. You are more focused on keeping your people happy. So what do you do? You go and ask the Minister for Human Resource that please give me, you are giving me 20 seats per year as an MP in the central schools. Can you please increase it to 50? Now, what does an MP want to do with 50 seats in a school which should normally be admitting kids on the basis of their merits? The MP wants those seats so that the MP can dole out favors to parents, not to the kids. They are least bothered about the kids because the kids are not voters. To the parents with the hope that these are influential parents in a certain locality. If their kid goes to this central school, the others in that locality will see that. These people will praise the politician and the politician will have a better chance and tell the other that, okay, next time you are in the queue, your child will get it. So these little favors are what is expected of an average elected representative in India. This demeans office. This brings down the level of legislation because the focus of the average politician is somewhere else. Am I making sense? Yes, you, <laughs> you are indeed. What would you say is the big difference between the debates at the assembly level and in parliament? See, assembly is very much uh, localized, regional. So, in a way, assemblies have day-to-day -day problems getting discussed in it. And they have the actual people's issues foremost. So, while legislation is a part for them, but the, we call them the MLAs, the members of legislative assembly, the MLAs, they have uh, smaller areas, more compact areas, and they bring the problems of the people to the house and they discuss that. In parliament, the constituency of an MP of the Lok Sabha is huge. In a state like Uttar Pradesh, five MLA seats comprise one Lok Sabha seat. In Orissa, it is seven uh, assembly seats, MLA seats, together put together form one Lok Sabha seat. So the area, the population, the, you know, simply the geographical area is huge. It's very difficult to cover all villages and all talukas. But parliament is more of a generalized approach of larger programs and how the implementation takes place at the national level. And states are much more regional and they have other issues because they have a whole different list of subjects that they deal with directly like police, education, drinking water, state roads and state communication. So those are very localized subjects. And now with the state like Orissa, for instance, we have a huge problem because we have lots of mines, iron ore, copper, zinc, mica, alumina. Uh, and bauxite, sorry, bauxite and uh, many other costly minerals are found in Orissa. They are mostly in the 
the part of Orissa that you have gone to, you are mentioning Kalahandi, that's the western part, northwestern part. Those, unfortunately, are all the forests of Orissa also. And added to that, the other problem is those are the places, those are the geographical areas that are inhabited by uh, the uh, indigenous people, by the Adivasis, by the Aboriginals. So with the new mining law coming into effect after Mr. Modi has taken power, he has relaxed norms of resettlement of the people who are displaced from mining areas. So this is a concurrent subject now. The state assembly discusses these problems, but the permission is granted by the union government, by the federal government. So when the permission and the licenses are given by the central government and the companies come and start working in uh, these areas, the, settle, the resettlement, the problems of displacement and every other thing associated, displacement is, you know, it completely destroys the families, it completely destroys the social structure of the villages. So what happens is that is under the state. So while uh, assemblies discuss issues like displacement and resettlement, and that is primary in their minds, the parliament will be discussing how to give out mines and how to benefit big companies. From a personal interest, and because you also mentioned Kalahandi, you know, I was there two decades ago. I was studying starvation deaths there, and this area called the Black Pot or Kalahandi had achieved notoriety. The newspapers were full of sensational reports of children being sold, mass migration, people dying from starvation. And I've written extensively about this, and we've talked about this before. What is the situation in Kalahandi now? Have things improved? It has improved greatly. And uh, I will not give credit to the people. I do not give credit to the government. I would give credit to the people. The people have worked hard, and today Kalahandi produces uh, per hectare yield of paddy in Kalahandi is one of the highest in India today. There is no malnutrition cases being reported. There is no food-related deaths, and uh, the poverty level that you saw two or two decades ago. I would not say it has vanished, but there has been a great improvement. Uh, there has been a, it is not industrialization or something, but there has been improvement in irrigation facilities. People are able to sow crops in their lands and there has been a development which has been noticeable. So if you uh, check your writing, and then if you have read this book by P. Sainath, Everybody Loves a Drought. Everybody Loves a Good Drought. Good Drought, yeah. I had read that book long back. He had focused also on, uh, mostly on Kalahandi. And I have traveled to Kalahandi. I am not speaking out of my head without going to the area. I have traveled there. And I have traveled there as an MP also because I was not representing that area, but the MP from that area was a friend, so we had uh, traveled and seen the area. There has been considerable improvement. There has been uh, better living conditions, uh, which people have worked out for themselves. So in a way now, I believe that if uh, people are, their lifestyle is not meddled with too much, with just a little bit of governmental support, they can work wonders. But sadly, I think uh, we don't even permit that. I have two more sets of issues, if it's fine with you. One issue that I wanted, wanted to request you to reflect on relates to the role of the Indian middle class. In most Western discourses, and also when we compare India with China, there's a lot of talk about how huge this Indian middle class has become how influential they are, how powerful they are, how they're changing, not just Indian society, but also the world. They've become important consumers. They travel all over the world. 
the uh, image of India has, and I must admit, I mean, just in the three decades I've been in Norway, the, the image of India has changed from much more of a negative to a very positive kind of impression. Some would say it's because of Bollywood and yoga and IT and all of this. So my question really is the role of the middle class and their impact on Indian politics as you see it, because as you recall several years ago, there were huge movements uh, against corruption and you had you even had political parties like the Aam Admi Party being uh, established on that anti-corruption platform with a lot of support from the urban middle class. What is going on now? How do you see the Indian middle class viewing Indian democracy development and also the recent, more recent conflict with China? How is this perceived by the typical middle class person in India? I have not been able to define is there really a, a singular stream of thought that can be labeled as Indian middle class? I'm not very sure. There is, of course, big part of the Indian middle class. If we take the terminology referring to the uh, amount of income per family to label them as in, uh, middle class, or if we take their social status, if we take their religious status, like are they of a particular caste, many states, they still have caste as a predominant factor where your money power is not everything. Your caste also comes to play. Your uh, financial background also may be affected by the geography, whether you live in a village, whether you live in a city and uh, your networking facility, uh, abilities. All these are, uh, you know, there are multiple factors in the average Indian scenario when you are trying to figure out what is the middle class. Uh, suppose you would label me as a middle class. I would say I would be middle middle class or maybe slightly lower middle class in economic terms. But if you go by caste, I would be the highest caste in the Indian setup because I am a Brahmin. But then caste is also in great many ways linked to education. Because it is not that uh, the lower caste do not get education. But let me put it like in my family today with uh, online uh, education uh, the only way for school children. My son who is 13 plus whom you have met, Harold Che. His school, which is an ICAC school, that means it's Christian father-run uh, school. It's a convent kind of, a, but for boys and girls, both co -ed. There, they have implemented online classes. But my son, when I was talking to him in the early days in April, sometime I was talking, he said, uh, Baba, many of my friends are not able to attend classes. So I asked him, why not? Because uh, they don't have uh, a desktop at home, they don't have an iPad, they have to study, they have to borrow the smartphones of their fathers where the screens are definitely much smaller. So they cannot see what the teacher is writing. Then if they have a, a telephone connection, then the, the data runs out, so they don't have Wi-Fi connections. So. I was, uh, again, it's from an article I read somewhere in one of these things that about 34, 35% of school going children have access to online classes because they have the requisite instruments or equipment at home. But there is a bulk of kids who do not have that uh, facility. So by virtue of being deprived of education for these long uh, lockdown periods, the children are forced to study on their own. And if their parents are not educated, especially if the mother is not educated, who is going to guide them? So the caste system is not only religious in India. That is one thing I have always been told. Caste has taken a larger format now where education, 
economy, health, everything comes into play. Your living standard decides your caste also. Suppose I am of a lower caste and I go to an urban center and live and I have a good source of income, my neighbor is very uh, unlikely that my neighbor is going to ask me, what is your caste? Some places they do. In North India, for instance, in Uttar Pradesh, or some places they might do. A final uh, set of issues uh, that I wanted to ask you, and that is you actually come from a eminently well-known political family. Your mother was the chief minister of your state. I met her, a very impressive lady. Your father was, I believe, an uh, editor, a journalist, and you yourself have been both in journalism and in politics. And you did something quite interesting. Well, among the many interesting things you've done last year, you decided to quit politics. And I read in some of the interviews that you gave after you announced the decision that it was because your son said he wanted you to spend more time at home and with him and that politics was just taking you away from him. What is it like? Is Again, I want to pursue this idea of, of trying to better understand the life of an Indian politician you are, of course, living in Bhubaneswar, and you would travel often to Delhi, and you'd be traveling all over. It must be pretty hectic. And then you have your constituents to look, uh, look after. Is it family, or is it some other issues that led you to realize that you wanted to just concentrate on that one hat of being a journalist editor, rather than having two hats at the same time? I believe all Indian politicians need to have a to have a source of income which has nothing to do with politics. They should be having a profession and then only they can be professionally good politicians if they know the problems inside out of one sector of uh, human existence. And I think that uh, journalism, publication of newspapers and handling an organization is my forte. This is one thing. Secondly, when I got into electoral politics way back in 1990, I had decided for myself that I will hold office, elected office that is, for total four terms. That means each term of five years. But I actually cheated on myself. I stayed up, uh, stayed on for five terms. One term as an uh, MLA in the state of Orissa and four terms in the Indian parliament. So when my sometime i might have mentioned it to my son and to my wife while gossiping with them so in the last election which was in uh, 2014 uh, when uh, my son went on the last day because that happened to be my birthday on 1st of april he uh, went to my constituency with a cake from bhubaneswar and he said, uh, Baba, this is going to be your last election, I hope. So I smiled. I said, well, let's see what happens, you know, if I win or not. He said, yes, I know you will win, but um, I hope this will be your last election. I had smiled and I had brushed it aside. Then uh, as the years went by and I saw that, well, life is, uh, you know, this is one life. I don't believe in the Hindu believe that there is life after death and we are reincarnate. And I always believe that this is one life and live the life as well as you can and make as less problems as you can for others. Create as less problems as possible. So before uh, 2019 when I turned uh, uh, 62 years, my son, he remembered it. He said, uh, well, you had said that this would be your last election. I said, had I said that? Had I promised? I, didn't, I don't remember doing that. He said, no, but uh, you had said that. You had said that to yourself that you will only contest four times, but this is the fifth time. And if you contest now, it will be your sixth time. So you have not kept your own promise. I said, all right. He said, why not stay back home and, uh, you know, we, we have a better family life. And my wife, on the other hand, Adyasha, whom you met, 
she was saying listen if you stay back if you listen to this brat then you might lose the day you took this decision you might be lonely you won't have this crowd coming home every morning you won't have your people you won't have the glamour of office be very sure don't get uh, swayed by his insistence but i must say that my son guided me on the right path and when i quit office there was no political complications it is not that i was not uh, i would not have been renominated by my party actually when i went to meet my former leader of the party mr navin patnaik first thing he asked me thrice that was on 5th of march 2019 he just looked up and said the target babu why why but why and i had before going to him i had committed myself i had gone to the media and i had already announced my retirement or i i would i actually used the word stepping aside from electoral politics and he was very surprised he said do you think there will be trouble uh, in getting the ticket i said no sir you have been very kind to me all this while and i know that you will renominate me he said then what my service is that uh, you will win also handsomely then what is the problem i said no i am confident of winning i am confident of having your confidence in me but i just want to live life in a different way he was a little bit uh, surprised and i don't know if i should add a little bit sad but he was a little bit surprised and i think he had not seen anybody in his political career stepping aside uh, and refusing a ticket well before a nomination to run well before anything even came up the people die to be nominated so my son's uh, advice has helped me i am a happier man now with i would not say lesser responsibility because i still feel very responsible for my people for the people of this country and but i think well life should change and life should be fun that's it your son has actually exercised accountability as it should be exercised he's held you up to your promises tasagat satpati it's been such a pleasure to have you on this podcast thank you so much for your generous time thank you so much and for actually listening to my banter like this i have been talking endlessly and i hope uh, it was not boring for you thank you so much If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Banick from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments and suggestions to in pursuit of development@gmail.com.